Very early in the morning, the chief priests, the elders, the teachers, the law, the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus. They led him away. They handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? Pilate asked him. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Now the chief priest had accused him of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? You see how many things they accuse you of? But Jesus still made no reply. And Pilate was amazed. Now it was the custom at the feast to release a prisoner whom the people requested. A man named Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the uprising. So the people came and asked Pilate to do for them what he usually did. Do you want me to release you, the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them, knowing it was out of envy that the chief priest had handed Jesus over to him. But the chief priest had stirred up the crowd to ask Pilate to release Barabbas instead. What do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. Crucify him, they shouted. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus into the palace, that is the praetorium. They called together a whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe around him. They wove a, a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with the staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, that is the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him. Chose to walk that road out of his love for you. 
triste y día y Jerusalén Los soldados le abrían paso a Jesús Mas la gente se acercaba para ver al que iba
Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left, and those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads, saying, See you, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down now from the cross. Save yourself. In the same way, the teachers of the law and the elders also mocked him amongst themselves. He saved others. <laughs> but he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we might see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing here heard this, they said, Listen, he is calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Leave him alone now. Let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. He said, And with a louder cry, Jesus breathed his Speak afresh, Lord, to us and your world of the cross of Christ and all it continues to mean, of how he staggered under its weight and hung on it finally in agony. However familiar it may be, 
save us from taking it for granted and forgetting the awesome love which it speaks of. Remind us, Lord, that your cross speaks not just of a single day, but of every day, changing every moment and everything. Help us more fully to understand and celebrate your grace so that it may shape our lives now and always. Living God in so many ways, this is the blackest of days recalling the darkest of moments, a day on which hearts were broken and faith tested to the limit, a day of appalling suffering and agonising death, a day when all hell was let loose and love seemed overwhelmed. Yet we can call this day Good Friday, for in all of that horror you were there, in the despair, pain, humiliation and sorrow, you were supremely at work, demonstrating the immensity of your love, living, loving God, as we recall those terrible yet wonderful events, give us new insight into what you did that day for us and for all. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We read scripture from 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21 and 24. Christ himself suffered for you and left you an example so that you would follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no one has ever heard a lie come from his lips. When he was insulted, he did not answer back with an insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but placed his hopes in God, the righteous judge. Christ, Christ himself carried our sins, sins in his body to the cross, cross so, so that, that we might die to sin, sin and live for righteousness. It is by his wounds that you and I have been healed. He was thinking of me, even then. I couldn't believe it. Despite everything he was going through, the awful stomach churning agony, which seemed to pierce my very soul, he was concerned more about my welfare than his. Yet I shouldn't have been surprised. It was so like Jesus, the way he'd been from a boy, always putting others before himself. I dared to hope that just this once it would be different. That for the first time in his life, he'd look after number one. Why not? Would it have been so wrong? He'd given enough already, hadn't he? Scarcely a moment to himself. The crowd's always with him, clamouring, calling, pleading, demanding. Enough to break any lesser man. And if that wasn't enough, his enemies had been there, stalking him, unable to conceal their hatred, watching his every move, waiting for their moment. He knew what they were up to. Yet he continued without murmur or complaint, always having time, always ready to respond, nothing and no one outside his concern. I saw him so many times just about drained to the point of exhaustion and I can't tell you how much it troubled me to see my wonderful lad pouring himself out in a constant act of sacrifice pushing himself to the very limit. It was useless to argue. I tried it sometimes and he simply smiled at me in that gentle way of his, knowing I understood full well that there was no other way. He was right, I know that, and I knew equally there was no way he'd come down from that cross. But I could still hope couldn't I? I still could pray he might be wrong. He was thinking of others, even then. Not only me, but a common thief hanging there beside him. My fellow women sobbing their hearts out. Even those who hounded him to his death, 
thinking in fact of everyone except himself. Savior, I come, quiet my soul, remember, redemption's here, where your blood was spilled, for my ransom, say to a group of people that are gathered on a Good Friday evening that have experienced many Good Fridays, that know all about the events of Good Friday. What do I say to lead those people to the cross as we gather in this rather unusual format on this Good Friday? Here on this Good Friday I'm going to refer to a Salvation Army doctrine, doctrine number six, that says we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ has, by his suffering and death, made an atonement for the whole world. 
so that whosoever will may be saved. In the middle of that doctrine is a word, atonement. What is it? Why is an atonement needed? How can atonement affect our lifestyle? The word atone means to make amends. You may remember live sport, something that we're not having the privilege of sharing in at the moment in this new and different world that we're temporarily involved in. But you may remember commentators talking about particular players that have made mistakes in games. And later in that same game, the player does something which makes up for that error. It atones. He or she atones for their error. But why is Jesus' death necessary? What is he atoning for? He was. He is perfect. Sinless. So what is he atoning for? Well, we need to go right back to Genesis 1 and the account of creation. And in verse 25 we read, God saw what he had made and it was good. He created man, then woman. And in Genesis 1, 31, after this, he said, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Everything was wonderful, just as God wanted it. Ronald Youngblood says that everything was totally effective absolutely perfect. At this point there is nothing to be made amends for, there is nothing to put right, it's all absolutely perfect. Even though everything is perfect God still gives Adam some do's and some don'ts. As we know the the fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was eaten God's perfect creation was tarnished and the consequence of this was that man was separated from God. Genesis 3, 23 tells us of this as Adam is banished from the garden. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says that your iniquities have separated you and your God. God desires more than anything to be in right relationship with his people. In the Old Testament we read of many rituals that took place to symbolise the removal of sin and its guilt. Leviticus 16 verses 20 to 24 says, when Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat he used to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all of their sins to a remote place and the man shall release it into the wilderness. Then Aaron is to go into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place. And he is to leave them there. He shall bathe himself with water in the sanctuary area and put on his ordinary garments. Then he shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself and the burnt offering for the people. To make atonement for himself and for the people. The goat carries the sins of the people into a remote place. Their sins had been transferred onto the sacrificial animal through this ritual. The sins of the people were atoned for by the offering of a variety of sacrifices through various ceremonial rituals. You may be familiar with the frustration that God had with these rituals as they became meaningless. In Isaiah, there are four specific passages that are referred to as the servant songs that prophesy the coming of the Messiah to take away the sins of the world, not in ritualistic sacrifice, but in a once for all sacrifice. Isaiah 53 verse 5 and 6 say, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. 
Each of us have turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As the sins of those in the Old Testament were transferred onto the sacrificial goat, our sins, our iniquities have been, Scripture tells us, laid on Jesus. And he was prepared to take them on for us in the most horrific, painful, bloody, slow, torturous execution where every breath would have been a monumental effort. Yet, knowing what he was going to face, he was prepared to do this to accomplish the will of God. He did it for you and for me. And his fear, his horror, his dread of the way he was to die comes out in those famous words of Jesus, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus knew what was to happen and in his humanness wanted that pain to be taken away. But nonetheless, he was prepared to be pierced, to be crushed, to be punished to be wounded, to take on the sins of the world so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be at peace, so that we could be healed, so that we could be saved, so that we could be reconciled to God. There's nothing new in what I've spoken to you about this evening. We've heard it all before. We've experienced that forgiveness, that peace, that reconciliation that comes from the atonement of Christ on the cross. But how do we live in light of that atonement experience? What effect do the events of Good Friday on that day over 2,000 years ago have now in your life and in my life? Those injuries, that awful death on this instrument of torture, how does it affect your living? In 2 Corinthians 5 verses 18 to 20 we read, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We therefore are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Because of the atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross and our acceptance of God's gift, that whosoever will may be saved, the events of Good Friday cannot just be thought about each year at this time. The events of Good Friday see Jesus pay the price for our sin. The events of Good Friday see Jesus taking our place, making it possible for us to be reconciled, our sin to be atoned for. The events of Good Friday say we are forgiven. We are forgiven. It cost Jesus his life. Killed, executed, tortured in the most agonising way for you and for me. Yet it cost us nothing. Paul tells us that God made it possible for us to be reconciled to himself through Christ. And we have as his ambassadors to tell the world that God loves them. God wants a relationship with them. He has given us a responsibility to live lives that show others what it is to be in right relationship with God. He has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Wow, what a responsibility. What a task. We are Christ's ambassadors. Our message, our lives need to implore people to be reconciled to God. So do we live atonement lives 
Lives that show what reconciliation with God looks like. Lives that show forgiveness and love and grace, even to those who don't deserve it. In Luke 9 verse 23, when Jesus is telling his disciples of his impending death, Jesus says that whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. We must deny ourselves, turn from what our desires are and, and turn to his desires and his way of life fully. Not almost turned, but completely turned to follow him in a different direction. Not holding a bit back for us, but fully following in complete self-denial, in complete dedication, in complete willing obedience to his will. Yet not what I will, but what you will, said Jesus. Will you say the same? We read earlier, Christ himself suffered for you and left you an example so that you would follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no one has ever heard a lie come from his lips. When he was insulted, he did not answer back with an insult. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but placed his hopes in God, the righteous judge. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. True discipleship is costly. True obedience is costly. True atonement living is costly. What is your response? Will you take up your cross, no matter what the cost, to be his true disciple? How could thou smile on me if in my heart I were unwilling from treasures to part since my redemption cost thee such a price utmost surrender alone will suffice. Down at thy feet all my fears I let go back on thy strength all my weakness I throw Lord in my life thou shalt have thine own way speak but thy word and your child will obey all in my heart lord thou canst read master thou knowest i love thee indeed ask what thou wilt my devotion to test i will surrender the dearest and best not what i will but what you will said jesus to his heavenly father how about you as we listen to this song being sung i invite you to to come to the cross just where you are spend some moments in prayer on this special day saying not what i will but what you will father
Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you for Good Friday. Father, we pray that we may live lives that say not what I will, but what you will, Lord. May we carry your cross in our hearts. May your cross be in our eyes and in our looking. May your cross be in our mouths and in our speaking. May your cross be in our hands and in our working. May your cross be in our minds and in our thinking. May your cross be in our hearts and our whole being. Amen. To see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross. Of wood. There's the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame. see the pain written on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood stain
Sorry.